brothers and sisters, uncles and aunties. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Jerry, for your very kind introduction. So I see some familiar faces and also new friends, so a very big welcome. Thank you for giving up your Sunday morning. Uh, I hope your <laughs> trip here will be worthwhile. I, I'm sitting here not as a Dharma expert. I would never consider myself as a Dharma expert. I'm still learning and practicing the Dharma, still developing. But I'm very grateful to BF for giving me the opportunity to share with you a little bit of my own learning. And hopefully I may exchange ideas with you and learn from you as well. Uh, I've always tried to avoid coming back because I always tell Brother Jerry that I don't have any more <laughs> topics to talk about. <laughs> but last year, if you, for those of you who listened to my talk last year, I, I spoke about um, protecting Mother Earth, looking after the environment, what's our role as Buddhists. I hope uh, some of the things that I shared would still be uh, fresh in your mind, but never mind if you don't recall or you were not here, I will share some of those facts again. So, um, all right, let me uh, go on to my slides now. Um, being a medical doctor, I apologize, I'm used to giving presentation with slides, so I just find it more comfortable, something to anchor the talk. So, uh, the title of my talk, I put down a plant-based diet, uh, a logical choice for the 21st century. Any of you wonder what, what I meant by a plant-based diet? Yeah, I think a lot of people say, oh, is it a vegetarian diet? Um, I deliberately not wanted to use the word vegetarian because I think certainly within the Buddhist context, certainly uh, for certain tradition of Buddhism, a vegetarian diet carries with it certain ideas as well and certain rules. You know, so I'm just going to keep it uh, the basis that is based on eating plants, right? Um, actually, if you think about it, right, where do all our food come from? If you look at the food chain, plants, right? Yeah, the origin of it. Uh, because, and actually, we are, the only reason why we are alive is because we have the sun, right? Because of the sun, there is the sun energy. I know we complain in Singapore, it's very hot. <laughs> and certainly in many parts of Europe now, they're having a heat wave. Uh, but actually, the sun uh, gives out limitless energy, and we are very fortunate that we have lots and lots of plants on Earth, right? Through photosynthesis, they generate uh, food for themselves, and also some of this uh, food that the plant has uh, generate, we could eat the plants directly, or if you move up the food chain, uh, the plants are eaten by other animals, and then there's also the option of eating the animals, right? So, uh, but if you look at it, without the plants, the animals will not be alive. So at the end of it, uh, all our food source comes from the plants. Without the plants, there will be no meat, right? Um, even for the fish, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, going down the food chain, it starts with the plants first, the plankton, the algae, and the like. So I think um, it's just, uh, the, the reason why I use the term a plant-based diet is just for you to reflect on whether it's possible to eat further down the food chain and in fact to eat at the most bottom level where we eat the plants rather than to eat products of the plants after it's been processed by animals. All right? So I make a reference to the 21st century because certainly I think we are very fortunate living in Singapore that when we think about life in the 21st century, Generally, I think in, within the Singapore context, we tend to think of it positive, po positively. Yeah, we tend to think, wow, 21st century, wow, amazing science and technology, medical advances, you hear about AI, you hear about you know, uh, healthcare, uh, progresses, how Singapore now has one of the longest, if not the longest life expectancy. So generally, will you agree that when we talk about life in the 21st century, uh, say compared to the 20th century or the 19th century, we tend to think positively. True, yeah? But the truth is that uh, in life, it's always not that straightforward. N nothing is ever black and white completely, right? So, as I've said, we generally, you say 21st century, we think, oh, progress, right? There's a lot of positive things happening to us. But 
um, at the same time, while life can be super convenient, super comfortable, we can sometimes you know, forget that there's another side to it. We always think that, wow, isn't the modern world such a fantastic place to live in? And for those of you who are blessed to have been born in Singapore or choose to move to Singapore and, and make Singapore your home, like myself eight years ago, I think we can consider ourselves very lucky you know, that Singapore is largely peaceful, is uh, largely free from a lot of the natural disasters that we are hearing a lot of. And we say, yeah, and we do have great infrastructure. You know, everything, uh, most things are working well in Singapore, right? But if you reflect a little bit further, and in fact, it's there, it's facing us. If any of you read the media, you know, the newspaper, watch the news, you know, we will realize that uh, the 21st century is also the time when Mother Earth and mankind, because we are part of Mother Earth, right? We are facing increasing challenges for our survival. Our survival, mankind alone, and what about other beings? You know, there are huge challenges facing Mother Earth. So things like pollution is in the news all the time, deforestation, climate change, extreme weather, and rising sea levels, right? And unfortunately, it's all too easy to get a bit numb and say, well, you hear so much about it, and it's very easy to brush it aside and say, well, this doesn't concern us. Drought, fire, flood, extreme winter, we don't get it in Singapore. It's so easy, right, for us to say, yeah, nothing to do with us. But I think as Buddhists, I would encourage all of us to reflect a bit further, to think about ourselves, not just as individuals, but ourselves as part of the ecosystem and how our life impacts on the world around us. Some of the phenomenon that we experience um, as is uh, the growing population of the Earth, right? Um, it's interesting that it was only about 200 years ago when the Earth hit the, the 1 billion mark, mark for number of human beings. But since then, if you look at the chart, you can see that the growth of the population is almost like exponential. And we reached 7 billion a few years ago. And it won't be long before we hit the 8 billion. And it's anticipated that the human population may level out at about 11 billion in a few decades. It may continue to climb. It may stabilize. We don't know at this moment. But uh, definitely in the last 200 years, uh, the number of human beings on Earth has multiplied by at least seven times. So there's seven billion, well, there's more than seven billion people on Earth now. All right? So this is neither good or bad. It's just uh, a fact of life, right? We have seven, more than seven billion people around. But unfortunately, seven, pe seven billion people also means that seven billion people who need to be fed, who need uh, a roof over their head, who needs transportation. So um, I'm going to share with you three charts, and this is the first of the three charts. And the three charts are the three charts are going to show a similar trend. The next chart is going to show uh, the trend in our global temperature, and also how that this trend of the global temperature, as it's rising, we all know, um, on average, is also closely linked with the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Now, when I was a young boy in school, I used to learn that the level of uh, carbon dioxide is about 0.3%, right? It's about 300 parts per million. But now it has reached 400 parts per million. So it's gone up to 0.4% of the amount of gas in, the, in nature. You may think, yeah, hmm, uh, what's a big deal? 0.3 to 0.4 is just a small amount. But we know that CO2 is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and every small increase in CO2 would lead to an um, increase in the average global temperature. So at this point, you're wondering, mm, I'm supposed to hear about plant-based diet. Why am I talking about the environment? I will come to that because I just want to set the scene about what the talk is all about today. And then if you look at the chart number three, if, again, you notice it's all the same trend. It's rising. This just shows that the amount of carbon uh, emissions, okay? When we say carbon emissions, is really where we get our energy from is from anything that we burn, gas, petrol, uh, diesel, uh, coal, wood, right? So most of our energy needs uh, in the world today still come from the combustion, burning of fuel that is stored as carbon. These are found on Earth naturally, but by 
burning this fuel, we are releasing the carbon as CO2. So definitely there's a very, very close link between the rise in the number of human beings with the rise in our energy consumption and the rise in the global temperature. So I think the science is there, and as Buddhists, we are obviously encouraged to be very scientific, you know, ahipasiko, to always not just accept facts as facts, but to investigate further. And I'm a doctor, I'm very scientific in my thinking, and then when I look at the evidence, I think there is no argument about it. Global warming is happening. It's happening because of human activity. And part of it is due to the fact that there's so many of us, right? And the other thing is, there's too many of us, but we are also consuming more and more individually. So it's all, it all adds up, right? Now, something that's in the news very recently, um, what's the link between Chennai and Singapore? Chennai is the capital of uh, Tamil Nadu, right? And it has a population of about 4 million people. I think it's either the fifth or sixth largest city in India. Is there a link between Chennai and Singapore? Just looking around the room, probably not many, if any of you have ancestors who have come from Chennai or Tamil Nadu, but 7% of our Singapore population are of Indian origin, and the vast majority of them are of Tamil origin, and most of their ancestors, they can trace their ancestry back to Chennai and Tamil Nadu. So I'm sure if there are any Tamils in the room, they will identify with what I'm trying to say now. It's like for the majority of Chinese people here, we can trace our ancestry back to southern China, the provinces of Guangdong and Fujian, right? So Chennai is also the ancestral homeland of other Indian people here. And it's been in the news, so unless you've not been hearing the news in the last one month, you will be aware that Chennai, they ran out of water. A city of four million people has ran out of water completely. The reservoirs has just dried up. And I heard in the last few days, the monsoon has finally started. So they are, thankfully, they're getting the water again. But for about a month or so, they were completely dry. They had no water at all. And it's very sad for a city of 4 million people. The first photo I show you is just a photo of the reservoir. And you can see how the water level has shrunk yeah, in the reservoir and how little water there's left. And this is a photograph of what it's like in the reservoir where it's all parched earth. And the people had to break through the parched earth to see if there's any groundwater left. You know, it was really desperate. And this is a photo of uh, the tower. It's, and they're supposed to measure the height of the water. So you can see it goes a long way up. So the water can be as high as here, can be here, but that's, that's the level of the water in Chennai uh, very recently. And they had to ship in water from other parts of India. And when they come, you know, it's a mad chaos. You know, the, look at the number of pipes. So we think, oh, okay. Just unfortunate, things happen once in a while. But if you've been reading the news, this is not once in a while anymore. Just last year, Cape Town, another big city in Africa, right? They ran out of water as well, right? Cape Town has a population of three to four million people as well. So again, the reservoirs went completely dry. Uh, so, you know, if you go back to when you were a child or teenager, do you ever hear news about cities running out of water? I don't recall. You know, I don't recall, but and yet we are hearing about it all the time. You know, and it's becoming very common. Would it happen to Singapore one day? You know, we have the four national taps. I think the government has planned well, but it may not happen to us, but it certainly is happening around us, our neighbours, right? And then we are hearing news about, you know, heat waves. This is news from last year, heat waves in Japan. But even now, in Europe, you know, in Paris, I think the temperature hit 44 degrees just a few days ago, and we are very blessed. I can't remember the last time we hit 44 degrees in Singapore, but 35 degrees, we'll be saying, wow, that's bad, but 44 degrees in Europe, you know? And I think there's a lot of evidence now, a lot of things in the news saying that man-made, you know, uh, human activities is leading to a lot of this extreme weather. And what else is happening, you know? Just earlier this year, a big, big cyclone in um, I was at most towards the end of last year, but I think only a few months ago in Southern Africa, Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe had the worst cyclone in human uh, memories, you know. You don't 
also said cyclone and these hurricanes with Africa, you know, you hear about it, yeah, in the Philippines, Hong Kong, but now it's happening in the Indian Ocean. And then what about fire, you know? There was a huge fire in Korea, South Korea last year. Right? But it's so fast, right? We forget about it because there's so much of it happening. And before that, a huge fire in California a year before. You know, so in recent history, in Europe, a lot of extreme weather. What are the scientists telling us? Right? I mean, this was a letter, I think it was probably last year, where 20,000 prominent scientists gave a dire warning to us human beings, right? And you know that for many years, many decades, they've been talking about global warming and all the trend shows that it's heading for the worst. And then mankind is, I just read from there, man star, mankind is still facing the ex existential threat of runaway consumption of limited resources by a rapidly growing, growing population. And then uh, the scientists, media influencers, and the lay citizens, we are not doing enough to fight against it. And if that the world doesn't act soon, there will be catastrophic biodiversity loss and untold amounts of human misery. All right? So it's a sad, sobering fact that we can just say, nothing to do with me. You know, I'm not part of the problem. Singapore is okay. But I would like to perhaps challenge that thought and say that, you know, as Buddhists, can we just ignore what's happening around us? Let's look about Buddhism, okay? Buddhism and nature, okay? Would you not agree that all sentient beings are, under, are interrelated and interdependent? You know, that we do not exist in isolation. Mankind do not exist in isolation. We are part of nature, right? Anything that affects nature affects man. Anything that man does would affect mankind and nature. And then it's also a fundamental principle of karmic laws that everything, every action has a reaction, positive or negative, right? We cannot run away from that. It's the law of physics, right, from a scientific viewpoint. Everything has, an, has a reaction, has a consequence. And we would all agree that one of the core, in fact, probably the most important value of Buddhist practice is ahimsa, right? It's a Sanskrit word. It's about the principles of non-harm and respect for all sentient beings. If you look at the Dharma, right, the, all the suttas, I'm not an expert at all. I've been to many Dharma talks, many discourse about the suttas, and fundamentally, at the end of it, uh, no matter how deep the suttas is, it's all about you know, living a life that is not harmful, number one, to ourselves, and number two, to other human beings, number three, to all sentient beings, and number four, to the entire world. In fact, there should not be any disconnect and say that, oh, I just live a life that's not harmful to myself, but I harm others. That runs counter to basic Buddhist practice, right? It should be non-harm to all living beings. And the Buddha Dharma is fundamentally ecocentric versus anthropocentric. Now, these are English words that let me just explain a bit more. Ecocentric means that we are part of the ecosystem, right? Uh, that means it's about mankind not being superior or having a dominant role in nature because that's an anthro anthropocentric view of life that mankind, uh, for some people, they believe they've been given, God has given them all the resources, all the animals for mankind to exploit, for mankind to have a good life. That has never been part of the Buddhist practice. Man is part of nature and we, don't, we should never see nature and the resources around us as something to exploit and for our own uh, comfort and enjoyment. But we should try to live together with Mother Nature and to be at peace with it, right? So that's what uh, the next line says, that humans are an integral part of nature and we are not in a position of dominance, all right? And the truth is, we are subject to the law of natural laws of the universe as much as the rest of all sentient beings. And the notion, notion that nature and other living beings exist for the benefit and exploitation by human beings do run counter, counter to Buddhist teachings. And when nature suffers, human beings suffer alongside. Okay? Let's look at Buddhist practice. Um, I would say this is my own view. I wouldn't say that it's ne necessarily the only view. But I try to keep things simple in my life and I ask myself, I'm a Buddhist, I practice the Dharma, what does it mean to me? 
For me, the main aim of Buddhist practice is to end suffering and to gain happiness. Fundamentally, if you were to reduce it to one line, I think that would be how I explain what my aim is as a Buddhist. You may have your ways of explaining to others. And for me, and I think if you look at the Dharma really, you realize that this can never be achieved through the pursuit of power and materialistic gains. Um, for those of us who have lived long enough, for me, I'm in the stage of my life and I've come to realize, yeah, it's just endless pursuit of the material things, you know, uh, the human pursuit, yeah, it never brings uh, permanent happiness. And for us to achieve happiness and to end suffering, I think we need to accept the laws of the universe, the law of karma and the law of interdependence. Interdependence. And that we need to accept that we need the, a peaceful and happy coexistence with Mother Nature and all sentient beings, right, in order to achieve happiness and to end suffering. If you go look at the four Brahma Viharas, right, these are the four qualities that we as Buddhists try to cultivate, right? Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. Let's go through each one. Metta is about loving kindness towards all uh, living beings. Karuna is about compassion and empathy. Mudita is about empathetic joy, how we can rejoice in other people's happiness. And Upeka is having even-mindedness and serenity, not to overreact when something positive or negative happens, but you just see things as they are. These are the four qualities that we try to develop. And I'm still developing. Now, this is where I come to the gist of my talk. A reflection on diet as part of our Dharma practice. Okay? And essentially, it's about sharing my personal journey towards a plant-based diet. I became a full-time vegetarian only about two years ago quite late in my life, but it's a case of always better late than never. And so I feel that there's many things in, in that journey that I can share with you. And I wasn't born into a vegetarian family and there was never any strong influence or strong motivation to, to be vegetarian. But I think over the years with all the Dharma practice, I came to my own conclusion that I should be adopting a plant-based diet. Right, and I think, uh, let me share with you further. For myself, as a Dharma practitioner, some of you may share the same aspirations. Some of the, my own personal key aspirations is to develop loving kindness and compassion. I'll put that at the top of my as own personal aspirations. Of course, I do want to deepen my wisdom as well. I, I do want to reduce my greed, reduce my attachments, and I do want to reduce my sensual desires. Okay, work in progress. And essentially, to develop these four qualities, two parts of my practice. Okay, number one is through mindfulness, meditation. And number two, through the practice of generosity, through giving. These two practices form the basis of me developing the four qualities. Again, I know I'm simplifying the Dharma a lot, but um, as I say, I'm not a Dharma master. And for me, I also need to simplify the Dharma into something that I can understand, that I can practice day to day. So if you look at loving kindness and compassion, loving kindness for me is about an aspiration for all beings to be happy and to be free from pain and suffering. And for this, it's a very sincere aspiration that really I do not want to see suffering in any beings at all. I do sincerely wish for all beings to be happy. Okay, it's a, it's a sincere aspiration. What is empathy? Empathy is about the ability to feel pain and suffering that other beings are experiencing. So even if other, we are not experiencing the pain, when we see someone suffering, we are able to empathize and say, I can really feel your pain. I feel your pain even though I, I'm not experiencing it myself. And I think most of us will say, yeah, empathy is something that we, we, all, we need to have. In fact, without having empathy, it's very hard to survive in the real world. This thing about EQ, right? right? It's, uh, a lot of EQ is based on empathy. It's if being able to read another person's feelings. right? You may have said something that hurts them. Are you able to understand why they may feel hurt? 
you know that, so empathy is a very strong powerful quality that we need to survive in the real world and it will smooth our path as well right um, and then the next line would be compassion what is the difference between empathy and compassion is there a difference I would argue that compassion is a step beyond empathy because Empathy is the ability to feel another person's or another being's pain or suffering. Okay? Compassion, in order to have compassion, you need empathy to begin with. You need to be able to understand, feel that pain. But having the sincere aspirations and also actions to lessen and alleviate the pain and suffering that other beings are experiencing. So compassion really is about putting into action empathy, and loving kindness. Because I think if we just reflect and perhaps meditate on loving kindness and say, may all beings be well and happy, you know, uh, I think that's good. That's the minimum start. At least we have an aspiration. But wouldn't it be even better if we, as Buddhists, if we want to practice the Dhamma, to put this aspiration into practice? That not only do I wish for other beings not to suffer, for them to be happy, but try to do something about it. All right. Okay, so I would say that true loving kindness and compassion needs to start by ensuring that our lives do not cause pain and suffering to others directly and indirectly. Right? This is something that um, was a strong mot motivation for me to adopt a plant-based diet. If you look at Eating, right? There's always this phrase, eat to live versus to live to eat. Uh, which one is it for most of us? Eat to live or live to eat? <laughs> That's what we will say, right? But the truth is <laughs> many of us also live to eat, right? <laughs> we do enjoy our food. And again, living in Singapore, I think we are very blessed. We have lovely, lovely food, local food, and also food from every corner of the world. Right? There's no cuisine that is not available in Singapore. Right? And the food is affordable for the vast majority of us, whether it's eating out or cooking at home. And I think we all agree that good health is a blessing, as Brother Jerry alluded to. Right? That, uh, I think it's the highest blessing of all. Right? If you want to be a practitioner and you have ill health, it's very, very hard to practice. And as I've said, it's easier to practice the Dharma when you're in good health, both physically and mentally. And I think we all would accept, although it's probably harder to practice, that healthy diet is a key component to a healthy life. Then the question is, is it then possible to have a healthy diet that is guided by genuine loving kindness and compassion? Can we nourish our body and yet not cause pain and suffering to other beings? The good news is yes, a big yes to all those questions. Okay? I noticed that some of you are taking photos, so don't worry, pay attention to the talk. I will send a copy of my slides to the BF organizer and you are free to share my slides here yeah? because uh, I'm very happy to, for this, you know, if you want to look into the slides further, so you don't have to take photos now, you can have a PDF copy of the slides. And then, for me as well, adopting the plant-based diet is also about developing my wisdom and mental discipline. Remember earlier, I said I wanted to reduce my greed and attachments. I wanted to reduce my sensual desires. So I find that actually being disciplined about what I eat helps me. Because for me, having a plant-based diet is about practicing the first precept to the fullest that we do not kill any human, any living beings directly or indirectly. And then, this is a very important thing that I'd like to share with you as well, that eating, you know, if you're able to reflect on the transient nature of happiness and joy, again, that's one of the core teachings of the Dharma, that any feeling of happiness and joy, and similarly, when it comes to unpleasant feelings, they are always temporary. It's, they are always transient. For example, the joy of tasting something nice, something very yummy. I'm sure in your mind, you can think about your favorite food. Okay, you don't have to share what it is, or favorite food, 
think about it and you can say, oh, after this, I'm going to go and have my favourite lunch or favourite Sunday dinner. But the truth is that no matter how nice the taste is, no matter how intense or how satisfying, the truth is, is it remains a transient phenomenon. A few seconds, a few minutes later, it's gone. Right? That is the truth about life. Whatever that we enjoy is always temporary. Then the question that I've asked myself is, is it then fair that other beings need to suffer and die for my transient enjoyment? This is something I'll leave with you to reflect on. That for me to enjoy my favourite food, another being needs to die. Okay? It was a very powerful thought for me. And I realised that it, one way for me to control my desires and to develop mental discipline really is to say, start to say no to the things that I used to enjoy because those things that brings me transient enjoyment means another being has to die. And it was a very powerful reflection for me and it's something I would encourage you to reflect on. That as a Dharma practitioner, something that we do every day, three times a day at least, eat. Can we reflect, can we make our diet part of our Dharma practice, based on Dharma practice, and use every meal as an opportunity to develop loving kindness and compassion. Back to some science again. Sorry, I'm a medical doctor, so I always have a duty to share uh, some medical knowledge with you. This has been in the news for the last few months, right? There's been a major study showing that dietary choices is responsible for more deaths in the world than smoking that wrong dietary choices kill more people every year around the world than smoking, right? So it's published in The Lancet, which is a very, very prominent and reputable medical journal. And this is an article in the CNN that says that what we aren't eating is killing us, global study finds. Now, what's interesting about this study is that when it comes to healthy eating, we tend to say, oh, we should eat less of the unhealthy stuff. And I think certainly that is somewhere we need to start with. For me, as a Dharma practitioner, I like to practice the Dharma positively. So you know, even with the five precepts, we recite it as the five things that we, we don't do, right? But as we all know, we can turn the five precepts into five positive precepts as well. That the five things that I want to do. So similarly with diet, rather than just look at what we, what we shouldn't eat so much of, all the fatty food, all the fried food, too much meat, too much preserved food, it's also about eating more of the healthy stuff, right? And I think it's a combination that will give us good health. So really cutting down the unhealthy things, but also making an effort to eat all the healthy things. And what this paper tells us, the second part, eating more of the healthy things has a bigger effect than avoiding the unhealthy things. But of course, it's best if we can have both sides of our, uh, to our diet. So again, I'm going to show this chart. Nothing magical, nothing special. This is something that we all know, right? Generally, for a healthy diet, we know we need to eat more vegetables, we need to eat more fruits, nuts and legumes. This would be like the chickpeas, the almond nut, walnut, uh, dal, um, fiber. And again, most of the fiber is found in the three items above. Eat more colors, not uh, artificial colouring, but to eat fruits and vegetables, multiple colour. The more colours, the better, right? I'm sure you heard about that. Try to have the food as fresh as possible and minimally processed. I think we all know this, but the truth is it's harder to actually adopt it, right? And the less of, again, we know it. Again, the evidence is very strong now. There's strong evidence to show that processed meat is a definite carcinogen. Right? It's like alcohol, it's like tobacco, it causes cancer. Red meat, the evidence is not there, not there yet, but almost there. That red meat, or at least overconsumption of meat, is also a carcinogen. Although the evidence is not as strong as processed meat. Processed meat would be, within the local Singapore uh, diet, would be the, the, like the lap chong, right? Uh, the Chinese sausages. For the Western diet, would be bacon, ham, sausages, right? And really, the culprit in the processed food would be the sodium nitrate. Because this sodium nitrate, when it's heated up, it gets converted into nitrous amine, which is a very powerful carcinogen. And there's a strong link between that and various cancer. 
all right, in our cancer of the stomach, cancer of the large bowel, and these are common cancers. And we also know highly processed and refined food is not good for us, so we should try and cut down anything with all the E numbers, right? These are all the colorings and preservatives. A lot of them are permitted, of course, but we should still try to avoid things with... So if you look at the ingredient list of anything that you buy, generally the shorter the ingredient list, the better. The longer the ingredient list, generally it's not a good sign, right? Trans fat, saturated fat, and of course overcooked and burned food. And a lot of this will come from like barbecue, eating satay, yeah? So how we cook our food as well matters a lot. So this is, I think, the summary of what's healthy and what's not, right? So we should make an aspiration to eat more of the healthy stuff, things on the uh, right of the screen, okay? And less of what's on the left of the screen. Okay, so some of the health benefits of a plant-based diet. Now, I think it's important to state that it's possible to get all our nutrients from a plant-based diet. Maybe I quantify that with 99%, 99.9%. There are one or two things that we cannot get from the plants, okay? So again, speaking as a doctor, as a scientist, I would say, but generally you can say more or less all the nutrients that we need can come from the plants. Actually, if you reflect on it, it sh we should be able to get all or nearly all the nutrients because even if you think about meat, what do the animals eat? They eat plants, right? So if the meat that we eat, that we believe contain additional nutrients that the plants don't have, actually, that is not quite true. Majority, most of it, because the animals have to eat the plants and then they process it into meat and then we eat the animals. So actually, the source of the food is still from the plants, right? But of course, there are certain trace elements that are, are perhaps lacking in the plants and I will cover those uh, shortly. So we know the scientific evidence is super strong that a diet rich in fruits and vegetables and high in fiber will improve our nutritional status, immunity, microbiome, and overall health. Microbiome, for those of you who are not familiar with the, this term, is um, when I look into the concept of microbiome, it makes me realize how true the Dharma actually is. That in the, in the Dharma, we say that there's no self, right? There's no I. You look at me, the human body, me, me, myself. If you look into the Dharma, when you study Dharma, it says that that I does not exist. Because even my physical body, what we take that this is me. Do you know that roughly for me, about two to three kilograms of my body weight is made up of bacteria? What I constitute as my body's own cell, and it's the same for all of you, about two, maybe three kilograms of your body weight is made up of bacteria. Where are these bacteria? They're everywhere, on our skin, in all the lining, in the, and then a lot of it is concentrated in the gut, in the large bowel. So that's our microbiome. And there's more and more scientific evidence to show that if we eat a healthy diet, that influences the profile and makeup of our microbiome, that we cannot get rid of all the bacteria, and in fact, we shouldn't, right? There's two to three kilograms of bacteria in our body. It would be foolish to try and get rid of them because the vast majority are good bacteria, and they help regulate many things in our body, They're our circulation, our immunity, and our well-being. So if we look after the bacteria and make sure that there's more good bacteria than bad bacteria, we will already be healthy, okay? So um, you have heard about... Um, probiotic, right? right? A lot of time when you hear about probiotic, it's about taking the more of the good bacteria, right? So that we top up the good bacteria. That's the concept of probiotic. But there's another concept that's telling us now that the prebiotic is probably a lot more important than probiotic. And in fact, the, the scientific evidence now probably heading towards that if you look after the prebiotic, you don't even have to take the probiotic. Then you'll be wondering, what is prebiotic? Any of you know what is prebiotic? Prebiotic refers to the food that we feed the bacteria or the ecosystem we create for the good bacteria to flourish. And guess what a good prebiotic diet has? A lot of fiber, natural fiber. 
So by eating a diet full of vegetable and fruits with a lot of fiber, that is the prebiotic. So a prebiotic, you don't have to take a tablet. There shouldn't be a prebiotic tablet. Save your money. If you see the pharmacy has a very expensive prebiotic, save your money, use that money to buy lots of vegetables and fruits, and that is your best prebiotic. By having the right prebiotic, the right good healthy bacteria will flourish, and that will enhance our uh, general health. This is something that many doctors are not aware of either. So it's something that is only that is becoming uh, more and more prevalent in medical practice. But in the future, you're going to hear people talk about this, that the diet is so, so important as part of our overall health. All right? So earlier I talked about the impact of diet and the environment. Now the second important thing is about our health. And we know that if we achieve all of this, we will reduce the risk of various cancers, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. And as we know, uh, the last two, in fact, the last three, diabetes, high blood, and high cholesterol, these are major, major risk factors for heart disease, heart attacks, and strokes, right? and narrowing of the blood artery, uh, of the arteries. Right? So, in fact, I always think of myself as a doctor, if I'm too good at getting this message out, I'll probably be jobless. <laughs> Because a lot of the healthcare is built upon waiting for people to fall sick. Fall sick, the doctors will come in and treat. So I'm doing myself and my colleagues a disfavor by promoting health so that you guys don't fall sick. Okay? <laughs> so, but I don't mind because I like to share good knowledge. And I also know that the truth is, even though I share today, probably a lot of you will not follow. <laughs> I still have unhealthy lifestyle and still fall sick, so there will probably be a role for me. But anyway, it's my sincere hope that whatever I share, even if you don't accept it 100%, adopt it 100%, even you take 10%, 20%, 50%, you will benefit from better health. And that is my sincere aspiration that all of you in the room today and all sentient beings will have better health, right? Not just through my own effort, but I'm just doing my little part. Now, I want to come back to earlier, we talked about the climate change. I talked about health benefit of a healthy diet. I want to now just give you a bit of the science about a plant-based diet and the impact on environmental protection. Now, it may come as a surprise to you that food production, right, or agriculture, contributes nearly a quarter of greenhouse emission that is responsible for global warming. So, we always think, oh, uh, the CO2, it comes from heating, right? It comes from electricity production, our energy usage, transportation. Yes, all those contribute to global warming, but food production, unfortunately, has a co major contribution as well. And overall, it's estimated that meat production contributes 15% of all the CO2 emission and the methane emission for that, uh, uh, that contributes towards global warming. And in fact, meat production is not just the CO2, it's the methane as well, all right? The flatulence of the cows, right? These are much, much more potent uh, global warming greenhouse gases. So, I think logically then, if you eat further down the food chain, it will significantly reduce the greenhouse effect of food production. And it's estimated that if everyone in the world, even if they are not vegetarian, but if we keep to the WHO recommendation of what the healthy intake of meat per day, which is about only 100 grams, okay, one and a half eggs, right? That's all the protein we need. We can already reduce uh, the uh, emission from agriculture by about 30%. And if everyone in the world turns vegetarian, we'll reduce CO2 emission and methane by 63%. And if we turn fully vegan, that means no eggs, no dairy products, it will reduce 70%. So can you see the big jump? If we all keep to the recommended meat intake, already 30% reduction. If we stop eating meat altogether, you will in reduce it 63%. And if you give up all animal products, another 7% benefit. So there are multiple tiers that you can aspire towards. Right? And the other thing I want to mention here is that about food inequality. That nowadays, with the increasing demand for meat in many countries like China, right? Uh, because with rising prosperity, the, the per capita meat consumption is increasing. Singapore is pretty high as well. 
One of the inequalities and injustice in the world is that more and more of the grains, you know, the corn, the wheat, and the grains that can be used to feed people are being diverted to feed animals instead, so that the animals can then be uh, cultivated for meat. And this has meant that a lot of the poorer communities in the world cannot even have access to the grains because the price of grains have gone up so much due to the rising demand for meat. So it's something for us to reflect on that the rising demand for meat by the rich people in the world has meant that food, basic food, vegetable, grains have become more expensive for the poorest in the world. So by eating more meat, we are also causing more people to go hungry, the poor to go hungry. So for the rich people in Singapore, I think something for us to, a sobering thought for us to reflect on. The next chart shows the carbon footprint of what you eat. If you look at the central chart first, this thing here, it shows the uh, equivalent number of kilometers traveled by a medium-sized car each time you eat 110 grams of the food. So if you eat lentils, 110 grams of lentils is equivalent to less than one kilometer of CO2 production in the car. But if you eat things like beef or lamb, can you see the amount of CO2 uh, the, um, uh, equivalent? That means each time you eat 100 grams of beef or 100 grams of lamb, it's like driving the amount of CO2 you produce from driving nearly 40 kilometers in a car. Just to let you know how much of an uh, impact uh, the choice of food you have. So you can see all those that are low down here, they tend to be more of the, except for milk, is part of animal product, but generally you find that yeah, all these uh, beans, broccoli, nuts, they have a lower carbon footprint compared to meat. And the meat, the red meat, beef and lamb has a far higher carbon footprint than turkey or chicken or fish. Okay? And then this just shows, this is a chart from America showing to get 320 calories if you have a plant-based diet, you only use very little equivalent of petrol. They call it gasoline, there, 0 0.0098. But to get this amount of calories from meat, this is the amount of uh, gasoline, right? Uh, gallon. One gallon is about four liters, if I'm not wrong. So to get the same amount of calories from meat, you end up using 16 times more petrol and carbon fuel to produce the same amount of calories. And this chart, this chart just shows again the, when you convert what you eat into the equivalent number of miles, you can see for beef, red meat is far, far ahead, eating further down the food chain. Okay? So what's happening around the world? Even in countries in the West, Europe, America, where you think, oh, these are big meat eaters, actually there's a trend now that they are starting to eat less meat. You know, where else the countries that are eating more meat are the East Asian countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Singapore included, Taiwan, the meat consumption is increasing. Right? So I think uh, it's inter interesting that in the West, there's a higher awareness about the environmental impact of your food and... Uh, they are trying to eat further down the food chain. The question is, can we do the same in Singapore? Another thing I want to share, perhaps not directly linked to plant-based diet, but it's about food wastage. Again, uh, whenever I have the chance, I like to share these statistics because I think it's quite scary how wasteful we are in Singapore. That the average, uh, uh, the amount of food that is wasted per year, it, it uh, works out to the average of about 140 kilograms per person. So if you're a 70 kilogram person, you're wasting twice as much of your body weight in food per year on average. You may not be personally responsible, but on average, the amount of food that's wasted in Singapore, if you think about it, is a scary amount. Nearly 800,000 tons, and one ton is 1,000 kilograms. 800,000 tons of food is wasted in Singapore yearly. It's shocking. Right? But this is what happens when you've got a country with you got affluent population, there is no hunger, food is readily available, even though more than 90% of our food is imported, but how we readily waste the food, the amount of food that's thrown away. So it's something that i like to you to ponder on. Think about the amount of energy that has gone into producing your food. Reflect about the effort of the farmers, you know, the fishermen, whoever has produced your food. Think about the shame if this food goes to weight. Reflect, for those of you who eat meat, reflect on the animal who has given up their life so that you could enjoy the meat, the fish, 
and then to think about whether it's right that you then throw the meat away. Are we then even honouring the sacrifices of the animals? Right? I think it's a very sobering thought that anytime we throw any food away, whether it's plant-based or animal-based, it's extremely wasteful. And as Buddhist practitioners, I think it should be part of our Dharma practice not to waste it because by doing so, you are contributing to a lot of the negativity in the world, global warming. And also, it means that we are not developing the, one of the humanistic value of gratitude, of being grateful for what we have and grateful for the sacrifices of other people, sacrifices of the animals to be sacrificed for us and we just throw them away. So it's just a thought for you to reflect on. Okay? So before you throw the food away, just see whether you could eat it tomorrow or eat it the next meal as leftovers. There, there's a lot of belief that oh, leftover food is less nutritious, but even if you lose 10% of the nutrient, be grateful for the 90% of the nutrient that is still there. And it may not be so tasteful, but you, it means that if you can reflect on it, next time we can plan better and cook the correct portion or order the correct portion. Right? Now, earlier I declared that I only became a vegetarian, full-time vegetarian, two years ago. Before that, I have a five-year period where I was flexitarian. I was working hard, trying to go towards a plant-based diet. And it's taken me five years to go full-time. Because, as I say, I'm not a very developed Dharma practitioner yet. I'm full of weaknesses. I'm full of my you know, de uh, defilements. I'm trying to develop. So whenever we talk about obstacles, whatever excuse you can have about not becoming vegetarian, trust me, I've come up with the same excuse myself before. The 1,001 excuses why I should not be vegetarian and why Buddhism has nothing to do with vegetarian. You may argue the Buddha was not vegetarian, our Sangha, especially the Theravada Sangha is not vegetarian. Trust me, I have used those arguments countless times before. So I'm one of you, all right? I mean, sorry, not, not to dis disrespect any one of you who may already be vegetarian in the, in, the, in the audience, but to those of you who are not vegetarian yet. It wasn't an easy path, but I can tell you that the day when I decided to switch from part-time to full-time, it wasn't difficult at all. It, in fact, I find it really easy and I was kicking myself for not doing it earlier. That I find that it's my own mental indiscipline and making excuses that make it hard. That actually, I, for a long time, I really had lost the desire for meat, but I don't know, there were other factors in mind that made me still continue eating meat, at least on a part-time basis. But anyway, some of the excuses that we hear all the time, right, is inconvenient. I'm sure for those of you who may be vegetarian, but if your family is not, you will identify with this, right? Family not supportive. This is an important factor, right? If the rest of family, especially if you have more elderly family members and say, oh, you don't eat meat, how are you going to get all your protein, all your nutrients? How can you, how can you as a young child be vegetarian? You're not going to grow up, have a good brain, we hear it all the time, right? It's boring, it's not nice, it's not tasty, right? I've said it myself. I get stomach upset with eating mock meat. And actually, there's a scientific basis, right? That uh, a lot of the mock meat is made from gluten, which is a protein derived from wheat. And actually, quite a lot of people in the world have some sort of sensitive sensitivity to gluten protein, wheat protein. So if you take too much of the wheat protein, you can get bloating, and lose too. So actually, there's a scientific basis that if you are sensitive to this mock meat. But another thing is sometimes in the mock meat, there can be a lot of MSG as well, monosodium glutamate, to make it more tasty, and you may be sensitive to the monosodium glutamate. So yeah, there's a lot of scientific explanation why some of us don't get on well with the mock meat. But actually, the vegetarian, the plant-based diet I will encourage is not one based on the mock stuff, but to be based on fresh, yeah? Uh, minimally processed, that should be the basis, then that is the healthiest. But of course, once in a while, you want something that, you know, uh, is more uh, manufactured. I think that's okay as well. And then, of course, there's this concern that it's not healthy enough. I may get anemia or I have anemia. I cannot be vegetarian. I cannot get enough protein, even though we only need 100 grams of protein a day. The rest, so if you eat 500 grams of protein a day, you know what happens to the protein? How do you get rid of the protein, the amino acid? 
urine, okay? You end up having very expensive and nutritious urine. <laughs> very good for the plants, right? If you eat a lot of meat, your urine is great fertilizer for the plants, okay? So our body gets rid of all the excess protein. So 100 grams of protein, the rest, your body gets rid of them. We're missing certain vitamins. There may be a grain of truth here. I will cover that. So these are some of the tips I have for successful adoption of a plant-based diet. I think the f most important thing is that you should never adopt it because somebody else asked you to do so. You should not do it because it's a religious belief. I joined this temple or whatever. Everybody vegetarian, I better follow. I mean, yes, it's okay if you go down that route, but it's even better if you can internalize the reasons why you want to adopt the diet and make it sincere and from the heart. That way, it will be um, very sustainable. Because if it's dependent on another person, your wife, your husband say, I'm vegetarian, you must follow. You do it to please your wife and husband, but when they're not around, you would still, you know, they say churi churi or still to eat, right? Because that means it's not from the heart yet. It's always better if it's from your own heart, you understand the reasons, the motivation, why you want to do it. And I would advise that unless you've got very strong mental <coughs> wisdom and willpower, which I don't have, if you do, and you can overnight say, wow, after this talk today, I'm going to stop eating meat completely. Sadhu to you, you know? I mean, great. And if I, a three of you in the room can do that, I'll be so, so happy. And congratulations. But uh, for the rest of us who maybe think, okay, maybe I'll try. I think it's okay to start and progress gradually. Because for me, it was a five-year journey as well. So for me, it wasn't easy. And I think it's important to incorporate variety into your diet. Don't eat the same thing every day. It's boring, okay? Unless, again, you're yeah, so well-developed spiritually and say, I can eat the same thing, it's okay. Again, good for you if you are that well-developed. And then have variety. Go beyond Chinese vegetarian food. Unless you are one of those that I must eat Chinese food every day, right? I'm sure most of us in Singapore, we are quite used to a variety of diet. There's vegetarian food found in the Indian, uh, Indonesian cuisine. Gado-gado is one of them. Indian vegetarian. In fact, there's a lot of vegetarian food there. Very yummy, very nutritious. Okay, Middle Eastern, right? Falafel, hummus, Greek salad, Western vegetarian, right? And what about vegetarian food in non-vegetarian restaurants? You'd be surprised that there are more and more uh, readily available vegetarian options. So that if your family is not vegetarian, your friends are not vegetarian, they won't have a black face to say, oh, let's go to a vegetarian restaurant. Right? Generally, they may not react so positively. You say, let's just go to one of these restaurants that have a good choice of food for everyone. And don't feel bad if you cannot be 100% from the start. Okay? Make it a gradual process. 20%, 30%, 40%. Make it gradual. Right? And this is a quiz, right? I'd like to ask this. Which are the countries that have the highest proportion of vegetarians in the world? India. India. You all know that, right? Yeah. Okay, second. Anyone can guess? Second highest? Taiwan? You say that? Hmm? Perhaps? No? Third? <laughs> Let me show you the list. It will be very interesting. India, okay, where it's about a third of the population are vegetarian, and they've been vegetarian for centuries. It's part of their culture. Israel, number two. Yeah? Shocking, right? Uh, yeah. 13% of the population are vegetarian. Taiwan, number three. So Israel is ahead of Taiwan. Okay? Italy. You think about all these countries as having fantastic food, the meat-based food. Austri Austria. You see, so the top 10 list is dominated by European countries. UK, Brazil. We think, wow, Brazil, they have some of the best beef steak. <laughs> yeah, but again, 8% of the population are vegetarian. Ireland. Australia, 5%. Singapore, actually, there's no data. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I tried to look. <laughs> I tried to Google, but I couldn't find anything at all. So if anyone knows the rate, I'd be happy to, you know, to share. But I suspect it's probably like 1, 2 percent. Yeah, but there's no data for Singapore. It could be that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, coming to an end now. Okay, tips for a healthy, balanced, plant-based diet. Because I'm encouraging it, I'd like to give you some tips. Aim for freshness, natural, lots of colours and variety, and minimal processing, meaning fresh fruits and vegetables, and the vegetable, the leafy side. In fact, it's the type of vegetable that our ancestors have been eating for a long time. 
right? Our forefathers, they eat a lot of leafy vegetables that grows well in this climate, right? And you have so many choices of the leafy veg. Good protein sources, soya, mushroom, lentils, legumes, beans, nuts, chickpeas, and corn. Corn, I need to share with you. It's a sort of microprotein. It's made from fungus, but it, in a way, it's manufactured. But it's grown, it's like, a bit like yeast. It's grown in the a, in a same facility as cultivating yeast, but it's a sort of fungus. It's made in England, and I'm sharing this because I have lived in England for many years of my life, and it's a great source of protein, and it's very tasty, and even in Singapore, there are like 15 different varieties of corn, right? So if you want to have a burger, sausages, bacon, you know, if you're not ready to go fully vegetable, you want to have some variety, yes, corn is a fantastic choice. Good source of calcium for you to think, oh, I'm worried about osteoporosis, right? Broccoli has a high level of calcium, a lot of the leafy vegetable. If you think about the stem of the vegetable, right, where do they get the strength from? A lot of it is from calcium. There's a lot of natural calcium in vegetable. So legumes, spinach, chia seeds, almond, and of course, don't forget our sun exposure, free of charge, okay? 10 minutes of sun a day. That gives you the vitamin D, and you will be able to absorb whatever calcium is in the diet. So the uh, reason why a lot of us are, have osteoporosis is because of the vitamin D deficiency, that we don't get enough sunlight because we are so good at hiding in the shade that we cannot absorb the calcium from our diet rather than there being insufficient diet, uh, calcium in the diet. Good iron sources, if you're worried about anemia, leafy veg, beans, dates, and of course, try to eat together with some citrus fruits because that, the acidity, citric acid will help promote the absorption. And for those of you with quite bad anemia, of course, you can take iron supplements as well without having to eat meat and liver. Omega-3, you think, oh, omega-3, you have to take the fish, right? Salmon and all that. But actually, do you know where the omega-3 comes from? Do the animals manufacture omega-3, the DHA and EPA? Are these manufactured by the salmon? Does anyone know where it actually comes from? It comes from algae. Algae, okay, the algae that grows in the ocean, they're eaten by little fish, then the little fish are eaten by bigger fish, and the bigger fish are eaten by bigger and bigger fish. So when, when you eat the salmon, because they've eaten, they're very up the food chain, they accumulate the omega-3. Also, it comes from the plant. So uh, by eating things like uh, walnuts, canola cooking oil, chia seeds, and you can also buy algae sauce omega-3. So these are fully vegetarian, fully vegan. And unfortunately, a little bit more expensive than your marine sauce, uh, than your fish sauce uh, omega-3. B12, uh, that is one trace element that is not readily found in plant-based food. So you need to eat the fermented type, things like natto, tempeh, marmite. But I think probably the easiest way, if you're turning vegetarian, is to eat the food that's fortified in B12. This is the real deficiency that can happen if you're not careful being vegan and there's no animal pro products. So B vitamin B12, take the supplement for that. Because not many of us like natto, and certainly it's a very acquired taste. Tempeh, again, acquired taste, but the amount is not that high as well. So the safest way, the only vitamin that you need supplementation if you are vegan or vegetarian is vitamin B12. That is the only vitamin that is really uh, animal-based. So as I say, supplements if necessary. And of course, uh, seek the help of a dietitian, advice if you are planning to do, do so and you're not sure how to do it. The next slide just shows that you can go beyond eating tofu every day. Because I have friends who ask me, how can you survive by eating tofu every day? I say, actually, most days I eat tofu. <laughs> and I'm okay because my, my diet is very simple now. But of course, once in a while, it's nice to have other things. And this is what corn looks like, packaging. You can get it from NTUC, Redmart, uh, cold storage. They are readily available. It's all frozen. Of course, environmentally, you could argue that you ship it all the way from the UK. Yeah, there are food miles. If you want to go down that line, you may say, I don't want to eat it. It's up to you. Uh, but again, 90% of our food has to be imported. Then you get the American, uh, this is another British brand, Linda McCartney. That's Paul McCartney's ex-wife, right? She had a range of uh, Angmo, Western vegetarian. Beyond meat, beyond burger, you heard about that. You can buy it now, right? And for cooking your uh, pasta, your spaghetti bolognese, or you want to have a stir-fry dish with minced meat, this one makes a good alternative. And then Western food, lasagna, sausages from South Africa. Yeah, this particular brand, fries, 
Gardein is from the United States, fish and chips. Yeah. And I'm just to show you variety. I'm not saying that this is necessarily really the healthiest vegetarian food to have. The healthiest is still the veg and fruits, but if you want some variety once in a while, yes, they are available. And many restaurants in Singapore and around the world are jumping onto the bandwagon. So do you know in America now, they are using the Impossible Burger. They call it the Impossible Whooper, is it? Uh, yeah, in America, they've introduced it. In the UK, KFC, they are coming up with uh, vegetarian chicken. You know, and in Singapore as well, there's more and more vegetarian options available, even in the high-end restaurants. Okay. So these are some websites which, if you are planning to adopt more of a plant-based diet, you will find these resources helpful. Some of these are lifestyle blogs, and they will like Eat Room Live is a is a blog by uh, an Indian lady who lives in Singapore. And she would actually review all the mainstream restaurants in Singapore that has good vegetarian options, right? And More Than Veggies, also a Singapore-based blog about how to adopt a plant-based diet. And the rest are good examples of both vegetarian and non-vegetarian restaurants that have excellent vegetarian options. You know, my favorite burger restaurant is on Orchard Road. It's Hans in Gluck, right next to the Thai Embassy where they, according to my friends who eat meat, they have excellent beef burger, chicken burger, but they have eight different vegetarian patties and four vegan patties. So if you're a vegetarian, you have eight, 12 different options for your burger. So it's amazing, and they are healthier than the meat base. Okay, coming to an end now, I just want to bring up this slide. Earlier, I talked about the inequality and injustice of the rich eating more and more meat to the detriment of the poor who cannot even afford the vegetable. But back to the link between meat eating and the environment, there's also this thing about the climate apartheid. Have you heard this term? It's in the news recently. Right? It's about this concept that you know, climate change is happening, global warming, all these uh, unusual weather pattern, drought, too little water, then too much water. You get the cyclone, hurricane, flooding. By and large, this tends to affect the poor. Right? Whereas the people who have money, the countries who are not that poor, they have the resources to build, to invest the technology so that we don't suffer the consequences. So this climate appetite is about the concept that those who are rich and well-off, we are consuming way beyond what we need and having a very high impact on the environment. Whereas those who are poor, who are consuming little, they have a minimal impact on the environment. And yet, when it comes to the negative e impact of the environment changes, we, the rich, we can avoid it largely. If it gets hotter, we crank up the aircon, right? We burn even more electricity as the climate gets hotter. So no matter how hot it is outside, in your nice office at home, we just crank up the aircon. We say it doesn't matter. No matter when there's drought, there's always water, right? But it's the poor places like in India, in Africa, some parts of China still, in the Philippines, the rest of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Laos, Cambodia, the poor, they suffer disproportionately from the impact of climate change. So I think for us, if we consider ourselves, we are comfortable. We may not be rich, but we are comfortable. We don't go hungry. Can we take on a larger chunk of the responsibility of looking after the environment because besides putting into practice compassion not wanting animals to die and suffer so we are developing compassion towards the animals directly but can we develop compassion towards the poor millions of people who are poorer than us in many other countries can we develop true compassion and say that as a Buddhist I need to do my part to try to lessen the suffering of the poor and those who suffer all the time. Because for me, that is the basis of our Dharma practice. Right? Rather, rather than come here once a week, listen to a Dharma talk and be uh, with the Dharma for a few hours, can we be with the Dharma 24-7? Everything that we do, can it be according to Dharma principles? Can it be based on loving kindness and compassion? And one of the things that we do a lot, eating, minimum three meals a day, that has a profound impact 
on the earth, on others. But can we use our diet and our eating choices as a way for us to reflect on the Dharma, to practice the Dharma, especially on the loving, kindness and compassion part? I think it's possible, and when you choose to do so, it will form a very powerful tool, and it means that we are developing ourselves daily, 24-7. Okay? So I think, uh, this I summarize, a plant-based diet is one way to develop sincere loving kindness and compassion. It's healthier as well. Hey, you know, isn't that great? It's less damaging to the environment. So these are the three reasons why I have adopted a plant-based diet, and I would encourage you to ponder about it, and I would encourage you to consider doing the same, even if it's not 100%, try to cut down on the meat consumption, and it is the perfect and logical choice for the 21st century. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Hu, for the very uplifting uh, talk. Uh, certainly, I think uh, we, we follow, everybody follow your uh, plant base. Uh, we definitely will uh, live longer. <laughs> so, okay, now maybe uh, questions uh, from the floor, if there is any for Dr. Ho. Okay, this one behind. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, just a quick question regarding red meats. Uh, you mentioned that red meats are suspected to be uh, carcinogenic. Are there different classes of red meat, or it's the same whether you are eating pork, mutton, beef, duck? Like, is pork less carcinogenic than beef, or you know, something like that? Yeah. Uh, thanks for your question. I, I have to say I don't know the exact answer to that. I think a lot of the evidence was looking at like things like beef and mutton rather than duck. So in terms of whether one is more carcinogenic, I'm not sure. But uh, I think just as a class of meat, red meat versus white meat, i.e. chicken and poultry, uh, is deemed to be likely to be more carcinogenic the, than the, the poultry. Okay, any more uh, questions? Oh, Dr. Henry, you? Uh, uh, thank you, Eugene. Yeah, just, uh, maybe just two comments. Uh. One is that recently there was a study where they actually an analyzed the stools of people who take vegetables, and they found that the more variety of vegetables you take, you actually get a greater variety of uh, probiotics inside. So basically, one, you, the, the emphasis is on variety. Then two, in Singapore, we're very worried about diabetes. One thing good, when you take more vegetables, yeah, you tend to feel full, and also it helps your diabetes because all vegetables have a low, be, uh, besides rice, have a low glycemic in index. It takes a long time for it to di digest. What we are most frightened of is things like your sugar drinks and your canned drinks, your sugar goes up very high, so your body thinks uh, that there's so much sugar, so the pancreas has to produce a lot of insulin. But very often, you cannot get the calibration right. So suddenly, you take in a lot of rice, and your sugar goes up high, but your insulin goes up higher. Then your sugar goes down, and then you actually feel hungry, and you eat more. So where just you take things like plants, it takes a long time to digest, so the sugar, that is produced will be slowly absorbed and you actually, it's better for you the long run. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Dr. Yeo, for giving the, yeah, and I think I completely agree yeah. and uh, about that other okay. additional benefit of having a plant-based diet, especially if you eat lots of yeah, fruits yeah. and vegetables. Yeah, there's one question from this brother. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Doctor. My name is Andy. Uh, I work at the MNC and I recently, uh, uh, I, I was, uh, in, in a, in, in, involved in a conversation with my colleagues. It was a conversation between a Norwegian, European, and Vietnamese Asian. And uh, the Norwegian gentleman was recounting his recent trip uh, to Vietnam and saying how disgusting it was to see dogs hanging in a, in a shop. Uh, and, and of course, the, the Vietnamese turned around and said, uh, but you do whaling in, uh, in Norway in uh, equally disgusting. Now, the thing is, I'm a... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a vegan myself, so I, I think both of them are wrong in killing either a whale or, or, or a dog. Uh, um, and that got me thinking because 
I think we eat um, we eat beef. We call it beef. We eat cows. We eat lambs. We eat chickens. Uh, today is because of conditioning. If you bring a if you bring a little piglet and an apple to a to a toddler, for example, um, I think instinctively the toddler will sink his teeth into the apple. Uh, heaven forbid, you know, for for the toddler to sink his teeth into the piglet, or or to tell his uh, parents, can we can we cook uh, Wilbur for dinner tonight? You know, so that's that's just unnatural, I think. Um, I, uh, I I I think you will probably end up adopting Wilbur as a pet as we would, as adults, adopt cats and dogs as pets. So I think it's a matter of conditioning, and now we've all grown up to be adults, and we eat animals as a very unnatural form of diet um, because of conditioning. And, not, and, 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 and proof in the pudding is that I don't think it's natural to begin with. I wonder what your thoughts yeah. are. Yeah, uh, Brother Andrew, that, that's a fantastic thought, and thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, because I completely agree, the conditioning and what is social, culturally accepted, right? I'm sure like in this room, if you were to ask, how many of you think that it's acceptable to eat dogs or cats? And then you put your hands up? Uh, no, right? And yet, for those of you say, how many of you, of you would agree that it's acceptable to eat pigs and cows? You don't have to raise your hand, okay? But deep down you say, yeah, it's okay. Because we are conditioned to think, oh, are these animals are worthy to be slaughtered, they are not as intelligent. But actually, that assumption is wrong as well because all animals feel pain. All animals, just like us, fear death, right? And no matter how intelligent they are, the one thing that all beings fear is death. And death at the abattoir waiting to be slaughtered, if ever you can imagine that, I think that applies to all animals. And then with regards to intelligence, there's a lot of scientific evidence to show that pigs are as intelligent if not more intelligent than dogs. So then to then say that, ew, how can the Vietnamese eat dogs? And then uh, here I am eating my roasted pork. And then actually, if you go by that rationale, then actually it doesn't hold water as well because pigs, uh, if you say you should only eat the, the not so intelligent animals, then you shouldn't be eating pigs as well. And then to say cows are not intelligent, that's not true either. So they all have um, brain, they all have emotional attachment, they all have love for their own young ones. You know, and then they feel pain and they feel death. So yeah, I agree. That is conditioning. What we say, what is normal and what's not. Thank you for that, uh, Brother Henry. Yeah, there's one question from Sister uh, uh, Annie. Hi, thank you, uh, Doctor. I just want to know because my daughter is uh, vegan, very, very, um, very strict one, and uh, we are trying to because she's quite weak also. So she's we, she's very weak. She yeah don't have energy for a lot of things, so actually we want to we have not lah but we we're thinking that maybe she should take egg, because egg is not not is is not unethical, because in Singapore the eggs are not fertilized, so what do you think? Because actually I think that there are a lot of things that we just cannot provide for her since she's so strict. That's the one question. The other one is uh, I I heard somebody say that. Um, if you cook the vegetable, it turns into nitr from the nitrate turn into nitrites. So is it better to take it raw and the other for vegetables? And the other thing is if you keep the vegetable longer, it seems that it turns there are more nitrates produced. So um, I just want to know a bit more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Two uh, the great questions. I'll try my best to answer. I'm sure Brother Andy will be able to answer the question about the eggs. Now, it's interesting that your daughter has turned vegan because I think there is an interesting trend I've noticed among the young in Singapore, just like among the young in the West, that a certain number of young people are making a lifestyle choice to turn vegan, meaning it's fully 100% plant-based, where they don't, have, they don't take anything dairy and eggs. I think it's important to understand their motivation for doing so because it's not strictly true that there is no suffering and killing for eggs and dairy production. For example, in dairy, you may say that, oh, they, we don't have to kill the, the, the cows, but actually they suffer because they are you know, constantly being pumped with hormones and they're producing amounts of milk that is not natural, right? So 
that is there's some certainly elements of cruelty there. But for chicken uh, eggs, it's interesting because you could say they are unfertilized eggs. So technically, when you eat the eggs, yeah, uh, there's, uh, there's not, there's, it's not alive, but it's the industry of producing the eggs. Do you know that um, for the egg industry, uh, the poultry industry, there are a certain number of eggs will be fertilized and because they need to breed the next uh, generation of the chicken to lay the eggs. So generally, the male chicks have no economic values. And there's no way they can tell from the fertilized egg which are male and which are female. So what happens, they got to wait till the eggs are hatched. And once the eggs are hatched, this is the, the truth. If I were to share with you, a lot of you go, ooh, I didn't know that. But actually, we are all adults, and I think we can just accept the truth that all the male chicks are cow on the first day. That means all the male chicks, because they have no economic values, they cannot lay eggs, and also supposedly the meat also is not that good. So they are sacrificed on the first day of their birth. And if I were to tell you how they are sacrificed, actually it would stand shingles down, you know, up your spine because literally they have a mechanical cutter, shredder. They just throw the live chicks in and they are shredded alive. That's how the... Yeah, yeah, it's there. So if you think about it, that's why the, that's why I can understand your daughter's choice to turn fully vegan. She's probably aware of what's happening. And in fact, I would encourage you to have a word with her to understand her motivation, why she's turning vegan. Because if you take an interest and understand from her, her perspective, it would then be easier for you to engage with her about how you can make her diet healthier without having to take animal, any animal uh, products. As I said, the only thing that's missing from a vegan diet is the vitamin B12. You can take a supplement for that. But if you feel that she's weak because, could it be that she doesn't eat enough? She might be anemic, there might be some reasons. The, so it's to work together to improve the quality of her vegan diet. And it is true that you can get all the nutrients that you need from a vegan diet, zero animal product. It's just whether she's having a healthy enough diet. Could it be that if she's the only one in the family and without the support of the other family members, it's hard for her to get all the nutrients that she needs, that maybe if the family supports her and maybe turn partly more plant-based, then maybe there can be more food on the table. You may want to seek the advice of a nutritionist and dietitian, but actually there's plenty of uh, information on the internet that uh, is a problem that some of my friends whose children have become vegan have shared with me as well. And I just want to reassure them that it's possible to have a fully balanced diet. It's just but effort is needed and support from the family helps a great deal, especially if they're not grown up and living by themselves and they're dependent on you to provide the food. So engage with her, converse with her, understand her reasons for turning vegan and support her along. Second question was, uh, I forgot. Uh, okay, raw and cooked. Uh, some people, you know, when the evidence about the processed meat being a carcinogen, they say, oh, that can't be true because a lot of natural vegetables have natural nitrates as well. And when you cook the vegetable, they turn into nitrous amine as well, in the same way that the preserved meat does. But I think the science now accept that there's no evidence that eating cooked vegetable uh, increases your cancer risk. And the thought is that because of the way vegetable is cooked, it's not usually cooked with very high heat. And the understanding now is that the sausages, bacon, and all those processed meat with uh, nitrates, the reason why they turn carcinogenic Nogenic is also the way that they are cooked. They, they tend to be cooked in high heat, and during the high heat process, it, there's a high level of nitrous amine, and that's where the carcinogenic effect comes in. So you could argue that if you decide to carry on eating bacon and ham to not overcook it, cook it at low heat to reduce the nitrous amine. I don't think there's a lot of evidence to support that uh, vegetable is carcinogenic, even if you cook it. But of course, uh, the more you cook, the less nutrient there is. So it's best to be eaten raw for those veg vegetables that are suitable for eating raw or for cultural reasons we are used to eating it cooked. Just cook it as lightly as just to kill the bacteria, so to speak, you know, rather than to overcook it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ho, for this yeah. sharing. And uh, for those people who still need some uh, questions, I think Dr. Ho will be around. Yeah. What? Oh, one more question. <laughs> From the youngest member here. 
Okay, so you said that we must eat vegetables, right? But is it still okay if we eat meat like once a month? <laughs> Fantastic question. Thanks for asking. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm not here to preach and say that every one of you needs to turn vegetarian fully or vegan. I think we all need to come to our own conclusion. And I think when the time is right, when you're ready, you can choose to be 100%, that's okay. But before you're 100%, you want to be 80%, 90%, 70%, whatever you choose. You want to eat meat once a month, once a week, that's okay. You know, uh, but just make healthier choices, eat the healthier sort of meat. Don't overeat the meat, don't overcook it. You know, eat the white meat rather than red meat, preferably. So, uh, I'm open. I always tell my friends that I don't see meat as a poison necessarily because, in fact, I don't at all because the rest of my family are not vegetarians. And my parents live in Kuala Lumpur. Whenever I visit my parents, my mom would always cook all my favorite dishes that I eat when I was young. Because my kids are not vegetarian, and I would say, please enjoy Amma's cooking. I think it's important to maintain family harmony. It's, it's important for me to continue to respect my parents. So, for example, when my mom cooked my favorite dish when I was young, which is for those of you who are Hokkien, uh, the Tau Yu Ba. You know, it's a fatty cut of the meat, uh, cooked with a thick black sauce, and she would put some eggs in it. I would respectfully eat the eggs because I'm not gone fully vegan myself because I want to respect my mom. I do not, it does not bother me that there's pork DNA in the soup and all that because I do not view the pork as poison. Okay, so I, I always make it clear to my parents I fully respect what they eat and I always tell them that eating meat in the right proportion is, can be part of a healthy diet. So I'm not militant about it and say that, oh, if the food is contaminated with meat, there's meat DNA, I will refuse to eat it because I think that is also not helpful if you are trying to promote the message. I think so. I'm of the sort that there's, there's stir fry meat and vegetable. I'll just pick out the vegetable. I won't eat the meat. I'm completely open to that. So again, with your own adoption, be careful, be mindful as you adopt it, as to not to upset other people, especially your parents, your grandparents, you know, and not to force this plant-based diet upon them. You can choose to do it, and hopefully they will follow you at some point. They, you become an example, but don't force it down people's throat, lit literally speaking. Thank you, Dr. Thank Ho. You. I think uh, that's, uh, we have some uh, Q&A. Uh, no, I mean, we finish a Q&A, we have some announcement. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we have some announcement. So maybe uh, the rest will just bear with us uh, 